God bless you. Once again, we are here with our systematic study of the Word of the Lord in the second book of the prophet Samuel. Today we will be looking at chapter 10, and I will begin with a very known saying. And it says, the lion thinks that everybody is in the same condition as him. And you will understand it along the course of this study. And in this chapter, we're going to see two attitudes that are completely different. The first one is David with a heart full of gratitude and mercy. And the second one is the attitude of the counselors of the king Hanun with a heart full of resentment and distrust. Second Samuel chapter 10, and it says, It happened after this that the king of the people of Ammon died, and Hanun, his son, reigned in his place. Then David said, I will show kindness to Hanun, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent by the hand of his servants to comfort him concerning his father, and David's servants came into the land of the people of Ammon. And the prince of the people of Ammon said to Hanan, their lord, Do you think that David really honors your father because he has sent comforters to you? Has David not rather sent his servants to you to search the city, to spy it out, and to overthrow it? Therefore Hanun took David's servants, shaved off half of their beards, cut off their garments, the middle at their buttocks, and sent them away. Now look at the contrast of two attitudes that are completely different. David wants to do mercy. David sends messengers, ambassadors to comfort Hanan for the loss of his father. Nonetheless, we see that his princess thought wrong. And we're going to develop this theme on the su supp suppositions. We all believe and we all suppose. And sometimes there are things that only exist in our mind. Sometimes they're just imaginations of our mind. And so because of this story, we see that David must have been a very pleasant person, as we see in the previous verses, where it says that his enemies, even his enemies, did favor toward him. So the king Amen from the Ammonites did favor with David. And we see that David did mercy. And in spite of the fact that he was a king in Israel, he was in a position of authority, he was not a man who was arrogant. He kept his humble spirit. In other words, he didn't get to his head. He did mercy. He continued in a position of humility, and that is beautiful. With a grateful heart, he was grateful because the king that had died had done mercy upon him and so he was just returning that and how beautiful it is beloved to have that spirit that we will not forget the favors that we will always have them in in our mind not because we're charging them back but it's because it shows gratitude from the heart that makes us look good in front of the presence of the lord even his word says don't forget the benefits of the Lord, so much less forget the benefits that the Lord gives us. And so we see here that David's heart is beautiful. Once again, he was always a grateful man. He was a man who always trusted in God. And even when he lived in the cave of Adullam, and now that he's on the throne, he continues to trust in God and have the same gratitude toward his God. And so we're going to look at the counselors of Hanan. And so they put doubt through these questions that they make to the king. They said, do you think that David really honors your father because he has sent comforters to you? So they put doubt, they put distrust, and that is what the enemy does. It says, 
Has not David rather sent his servants to you to search the city, to spy it out, to overthrow it? So they thought that the attitude of those men didn't come in good faith. And they thought, and here we're going to notice something. We're going to take this word, write it down, to think. They thought that it was not a friendly visit, but that it was a visit to spy them out. And they humiliated David's ambassadors, uncovering their nakedness when they cut their garments. And even, even they cut their beards off. And so there's a law that says that the Jews were not to shave uh, their beards. And so it was a complete humili humiliation. And they believed that so much kindness from David could not be true. They did not believe. They knew that David had submitted all of his enemies under him. And remember that the Ammonites were enemies of Israel. And now they thought, how is it that David is interested in the well-being of a enemy king? So they were assuming they believed it. They thought it. And it was not a reality. It says that it, they did not confirm. And the question is this, brothers and friends and sisters, how many mistakes have we made because we're assuming something? We have taken as given a situation without first confirming whether it's true or not. These advisors let themselves be taken away by what they thought and they made decisions before they confirmed. And so a king who was their friend they turned him into an enemy friend because of their suppositions, because of what they thought, because of what they believed. The expressions such as, oh, I thought, I believed, or it seems to me, can bring us many, many headaches. I consider that we should meditate on this and not allow ourselves to be taken by hearing versions or or words from other people without going to the fountain. We should always confirm and we should always speak with the person, not with the ones that come and tell us something about the person. The versions change from mouth to mouth very much. A comment can vary very much inside of the person's heart who has resentment and hatred, not always what we think or we believe is the truth. Our suspicions could be led by the wickedness of our heart and not by the discernment of the Holy Spirit. To live according to our imaginations can end in the loss of true friends. The I believed, oh, because I believed, because I thought, you know, we all think and we all believe. But many times it is not the truth or the real situation. We think so much, and many of our thoughts, beloved, are not led by the Holy Spirit, but by our own imaginations. The, they told me, or I've heard it, is not the sure fountain. Go to the right person. Let's go to the right person to clear up the situation and look for the truth. And we're going to look at the case, and here is a case that can give us light about this and clarify to us what we are speaking about. And we're going to go to the first book of Samuel, chapter 10. And we're going to look at the situation when Saul was crowned as king. And we're going to see something here that's going to help us to clear this up. In verse 27, it says, when they had chosen him as a king already, and they presented him, they crowned him, they anointed him. And verse 27 says, But some rebels said, How can this man save us? So they despised him and brought him no presents. But he held his peace. Some perverse men or rebels did not honor him and it was a grave offense to present oneself to the king without a gift but Saul did not confront this act of rejection or this lack of re this lack of uh, reverence and this was a big mistake in the beginning of his kingdom maybe he did not want to look bad 
He was always a person who was very conscious of himself. Maybe it was an action of cowardness to not confront them, so he wouldn't lose them in his kingdom. And so we don't know how many suppositions he could have made regarding this situation. But what we do know is that Saul ended up being a resentful man, a distrusting man, and a paranoid man. We should pray, beloved in Christ, for a mind that is in harmony with the mind of God. We are going to see 1 Corinthians chapter 2 in verse 16. If you don't have a Bible, you can take notes and meditate on these verses because we can say that 99% of the misunderstandings, it's precisely because we think, we believe, we imagine. Somebody told me, somebody heard. And in reality, they're traps of the enemy that have nothing to do with the truth. And so the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 2.16, it says, For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. That our understanding, beloved in Christ, will be illuminated through the Holy Spirit so that we will have the mind of Christ. Let's remember that the Lord Jesus never thought bad or wrong about anything. Why do we know it? Because the Word says it itself. Thoughts of good I have towards you. Ephesians chapter 4.23, we're going to read it in the New Testament. I really enjoy the studies when we bring the word in the Old Testament and bring it to the New Testament. It broadens our spiritual understanding of the word of the Lord. And so we're going to see Ephesians chapter 4 verse 23 and what the New Testament says. The Apostle Paul says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Our mind needs to be renewed. We come with a mind that is damaged, uh, not that we have mental problems, but if there is resentment, we can get to the point of having mental problems. If there is hatred, bitterness, if we cannot forgive, we can end up with serious mental problems. Our mind is not healed when we keep all this in our hearts. The mind and the heart go hand in hand. And so we're going to go and see what the Apostle says once again. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It is a total renovation. We have to clean that chip. Our chip is contaminated. And it has a lot of wrong information. It has a lot of negative information. And especially negative things. Uh, negative mind. And so as we can see, the Apostle Paul speaks to us about renewing our mind. Since the spiritual battles originate in the mind, that is the battlefield of the mind. That is where Satan sends the most darts so that we will take actions according to the purposes of Satan and not the purposes of God. Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, God has thoughts of good towards us and not of evil. So we need to think like God thinks. Why? Because we have the mind of Christ. How is it that we acquire it through the knowledge of Christ and through the knowledge of the truth in Christ? And you might be able to say, well, what if what I'm thinking is correct? Well, that's a good question. Well, I'm thinking and I'm seeing evidence. Well, let's confirm it first, because even what we see, the enemy is a specialist in distorting even our vision. And so we have to confront, let's have enough courage to confront, not in a spirit of war, let's not show up with our weapons and, you know, I'm coming to confront you because this or that. No, no, not like that, but with a with a flag of peace that the Holy Spirit gives us. And let's go with a person that you and I suppose that has something against us. Maybe it's a misunderstanding. Listen, this is not a maybe. This is a truth. We all offend with our words. Maybe the person is offended, resentful, and it is a good thing to have 
that confrontation, not of war, but of peace, to bring peace and unity. And so now, if it was true, let's go to the extreme. Okay, you know, I hate you, I can't forgive you, get away from me. Let's just say that that was true. And if and uh, it's what we were thinking, then let's take the example of David. There is an example that can guide us, that is going to guide us when it is true what we're thinking. Even though it is the truth, it doesn't give us the right to hate. We have no right. The Holy Spirit does not give us that right. That right is not for us. That right is a right that the enemy has because it is his specialty to bring that division, hatred, resentment. Those That's his arsenal. But for us, our spiritual weapons is love, is forgiveness, is to forget, to not keep the resentment. That is what belongs to us. That is what should be what concerns us if we have the mind of Christ, if we truly have been born again, if we truly are clothed in the new man, like Ephesians 4, 23, uh, verse 24 says, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God. And so if we are in Christ, our old mind is inoperant so that we can think like Christ through his word, through what he teaches us, through his guidance, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And so therefore, beloved in Christ, all of those battles, they are effectuated according to the purposes of the enemy when we think negative. And if it was true, let's see what the word suggests us. If it was true, if what we're thinking is true, let's go to Second Samuel chapter 10. The scripture says in Second Samuel chapter 16, verse 12 says, it says, it may be that the Lord will look on my affliction and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing this day. So what is David saying when David is going through the greatest affliction of his life, when he's running because Absalom, his son, had uh, was had overtaken the kingdom, had taken his women, had taken Jerusalem, besieged his throne. And he's afflicted, he's broken, he's humiliated, he's humbled. And so there are some uh, some people who were servants of uh, they were sons of of Shimei and they went along the hillside and they cursed him and so the men of David were always prepared to defend him but look at David's attitude David had matured here David had matured through the pain through the brokenness through the many battles through the many tasteless situations, through the communion with God, he had matured. There is a process of maturity. The immature becomes violent. The immature believes all things because they're immature. They don't reason. They don't think with the mind of Christ. They think with a carnal mind. But here David had already matured spiritually and they are cursing him. And he himself says, let them. Let them curse for, let him curse for so the Lord has ordered him. It may be that the Lord will look on my affliction and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing this day. So look at David's attitude. And this is the advice of the word of the Lord. Let's leave every matter in the hands of the Lord. And if there are people who curse us, if they are people who cannot uh, don't want to be around us but let's remember that we're not a golden coin we're not going to be liked by everybody we do not have the right to be, become undisposed everything is in the hands of God and that our attitude will be like the attitude of David with an enemy because the Ammonites were enemies he sent his ambassadors to comfort the son for the loss of the father, the king who had just died. And he says, I want to do mercy. And he wanted to make a covenant. He wanted to make a covenant to do favor towards the kingdom of the man that had taken the possession, in this case, Hanan. Now, the tragic of this story, 
because this there is a big tragedy here and it is this that the friend the king that was a friend they turned him into an enemy and David was a warrior and David was always ready and he was trained for war but let's notice that David got angry and so we're going to go back to chapter 10 of 2 Samuel. It doesn't say that David took the weapons and said, I'm going to finish him off right now. That's not what the scripture says. It says only verse 5, when they let him know, it says, um, so he sent to meet them because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, wait at Jericho until your beards have grown and then return. And when the people of Ammon saw that they had made themselves repulsive to David, the people of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rehoab. So David was angry. Yes, it was true. David got angry. But it doesn't say here that he raised up his men to go and fight against Ammon. No. But when the sons of Ammon, they themselves says, oh, we have become repulsive to David. Then the sons of David, the, I'm sorry, the sons of Ammon, what did they say? They went and they hired the Syrians of Beth to go against David. So look at this whole story, how it has developed by believing, by supposing, by thinking, by having suspicions. All of this story and the way it has developed. Yes, David was angry. It was tremendous what they did with his men when he sent them uh, for something good. But nonetheless, he did not begin to gather armies. It was the Ammonites because of their suppositions. Oh, David's mad. This he's gonna. David's gonna attack us, and so they hired the army to go and attack David. And so basically, they they lit up the match. And so verse 7, it says, Now when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the army of the mighty men. So what did he have to do? He had to defend himself because the city of Jerusalem was in danger. The life of his men was in danger. His government, everything, his reputation as a king, because they had done wrong. They had humiliated his men. But David did not begin the war, but it was the Ammonites that began it because of their suppositions. The word of the Lord says in Ephesians 4.26, get angry, but do not sin. Yes, yes, we can get mad and we do get mad because anger is an emotion and it is an emotion that is showing us it is a, a, a red light that is telling us stop and it is the moment to stop. But we see the red light, or we see the yellow light, and we step on the gas pedal when we are driving. And the same thing happens with our emotions. That the light begins to flash, and it begins to change color, and we continue. And that is when we sin. But to get angry shows us that there is something wrong in the other person that is causing us that uncomfort or in ourselves that we do not know how to receive the words with humility. And so see how uh, getting angry is not sin. The sin is when we explode in this case. The David exploded, but it was not because of evil. It was in self-defense to protect his kingdom. If they had not raised up an army against David because they supposed and they thought that David was so angry over this. And so they continued to suppose and uh, they, they would have had a reconciliation because David wanted to do mercy upon them. Why did he want to do mercy upon them? Because of the king Nahas had done favor towards him. So this whole, this whole war without need. And so verse 22, sorry, verse 12 tells us the 
results. Be of good courage and let us be strong for our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what is good in his sight. Why did they go to war? And why is there this this word of encouragement? It says, be of good courage and let us be strong for our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what is good in his sight. So David arose to defend the city of Jerusalem. And he put that battle in the hands of God. And that's what we need to do. There's a war. There's a lot of war. There's battles. A lot of battles. But the biggest war, the biggest battle, and the most destructive battle originates in our mind. Let's let God act let's not get ahead of ourselves i know that as humans many times our emotions win win us over yes get angry yes but do not sin let's not get out of orbit orbit with bad words with bad actions uh, becoming violent no yes it's it's good to get angry. We need to meditate. Hey, I'm wrong here. I need to meditate. I'm not tolerant. Or we see that the other person is definitely out of control. And we say, God, do something with this person. But it's very different when we do what the Ammonites did. It was terrible because of what they thought, because of what they believed, because of what they supposed, and they went too far. And so Joab came close. Joab and the people who were with him drew near for the battle against the Syrians. And they fled before them. And this was a tremendous defeat. And so we're going to read this. This shows us the results of the unity of the people. We're going to look at this part now. And they said, hey, let's fight for our city. Let's not the enemy come and destroy with these things let's fight for our city and we see the unity to overcome the enemy do we want to overcome the enemy let's unite let's not divide being courageous and putting effort all the leaders we all should um, be of good courage as one along with all the people of God to stop all the attacks of the enemy and let God do as he pleases this is a beautiful verse it says and may the lord do what is good in his sight let that be our attitude as sons of god as daughters of god let him be the one who does it let's let the whole matter in the hands of god but the tragic thing out of this whole story is that the king that was a friend they turned him into a an enemy and let me tell you what happened the victory was total in verse 19. We're going to see the total victory. And it was a tragedy for Ammon. And it was a tragedy for the ones who were hired to be the army of the Ammonites and go against David and his men. And in verse 19 speaks to us about the total victory. And when all the kings who were servants to Hadadezer saw that they were defeated by Israel, they made peace with Israel. Look, everything works for good. They wanted to do evil to David and his men because of what they thought, because of what they believed, because of what they supposed, because of their suspicions. But what happened? that all the enemies of David here, the Syrians, made peace with Israel and served them. And there, from there forward, it says, so the Syrians were afraid to help the people of Amen anymore. So it's beautiful to leave everything in the hands of God. Amen? Look at that total victory. They made peace with Israel. They served them. And from there forward, the Syrians were afraid to help the people of Amen anymore. Do not help with the evil of the evil, the one of evil thoughts or the one of a long evil tongue. What should we learn from this lesson? Let's always have a thankful heart towards God, knowing that He is with us at all times. Second, not do not have a heart full of distrust. 
and do not live according to what we believe or what we think without first confirming. We should confront till we get to the bottom of the truth and wait on the Lord before in the beginning of the ministry, the pastoral ministry, because it's very different from being many years, about over 20 years in the evangelistic ministry. And I would, you one takes the message and you leave and the pastor stays there with his problems. And one has a good time and you, one goes in the name of the Lord. And uh, one gives what the Lord gives, whether it's strong uh, admonition or correction, word of hope, whatever it may be. And the evangelist leaves, but the pastor stays with a problem and knows what is going on in their congregation. So therefore, but in the pastoral ministry, it is different, very different, let me tell you. And so not just us um, as leaders, but we all need to learn to wait on the Lord. I didn't used to wait. I'd find out the problem and fast I wanted to bring a solution to the problem. And instead of bringing a solution, I would make it worse. It would happen to me as the one from Amen. Well, this is like this, let's go and attack. But through the years, through the experiences, through the pain, through much pain, we learn to wait on the Lord. And many times the strong conflicts when one less expects, they get resolved. Who did it? The Lord as the Lord thinks best, and that is the best way to think. And so we need to be strong as people of God in unity, becoming one to be against the attacks of the enemy so they will be stopped. And this is very important, I repeat, leave every matter in the hands of our God. So now we're going to see something else. Fourth, let's not take as a fact the comments. This is very important. Don't take other people's comments as facts and gossip don't take gossip as facts gossip comes from people who have no um, they have no righteous them righteousness in them they are people who whose tongues uh, are inflamed by hell and they might say oh well i have a good intention but let me tell you someone who comes to speak bad about somebody else to you is not it does not have a good intention because just like they come to talk to you about somebody else the one who comes to bring you information also gave information about you there is an interchange of information do not doubt that and so lastly we're gonna see proverbs uh, 23 verses 7 to 9 as the man thinks in his heart so he is and that's why in the beginning i said the lion thinks everybody is like him so as a man thinks in his heart so is his heart so the mind and the heart walk hand in hand what we think is going to affect our emotions you think negative your emotions are going to be boiling but also if our heart is filled with wickedness we're going to think bad about everything and everybody and so I'm going to take some paragraphs from a book written by Joyce Meyer. And she wrote a book titled, You Can Win the Battle in Your Mind. And she cites precisely Proverbs 23, verse 7. And she says that one cannot have a positive mind and a, an exciting mind in a negative mind. And I repeat this to you. Joyce Meyer writes this. You cannot have a positive and exciting mind in a negative mind. She adds, if you battle against negative thoughts, it is important that you will confront with the fact that your life will not change until your thoughts change. And this is tremendous. This is powerful. Our life is not going to change until our mind changes, until we have the mind of Christ. If we have a negative mind, it's a fact that our life is going to be a failure. And the most terrible thing that uh, Joyce Meyer shares is that if the enemy controls our thoughts, he will also be controlling our lives.
And to finish, I will finish with the advice of God. And this is the advice that God gave to Joshua in chapter 1. And it's in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 8. And it says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So as we can see the response to all the suppositions into thinking negative is to fill our mind with the word of God, to think according to the mind of Christ, renovating our mind day by day until we live in the manner that Christ lived. He never felt rejected or offended though he knew the minds do you think that god doesn't know our thoughts that he doesn't know our words it says that the word's not even in our mouth and he already knows that word nonetheless he always showed mercy and he continues to show mercy and favor toward us because he has thoughts of good and not of evil toward us beloved in christ May God bless you abundantly. May God keep our mind, protect our mind. This is the battlefield of the mind. Here is the platform for the enemy if we give him that right. May the Lord continue to bless you abundantly is the desire of my heart. Blessings. Oh